So they are sacrificing for whatever may happen. They are now in one, only waiting for, for the right time. You are now fully aware of the consequences of your actions. In the middle of the conflict is an oasis of hope for the unwitting victims in the tug of war over Sabah. They are the thousands of stateless Filipino children born in Malaysia but denied the basic right to education. Four of Nora in Rudy's eight children are going to school finally. Hindi ho sila pwede mag-aral sa Malaysian school. Hindi sila pinapayagan. Hindi naman pero wala silang surat. Walang dokumento. Walang dokumento. Uh, mm -hmm. Alam ba nila kung kailan ang birthday nila? Alam, alam nila. Pero may birth certificate ba sila? Wala. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Sinong panganay? Na Jimin. Na Jimin. Mm. Kamusta ang school? Masaya ba? Sagot. Okay. Okay. Anong natutunan niya? Apa kau belajar di dalam sekolah? Melayu English. Apa? Apa? Apa yang Melayu? Membaca. Membaca. Magbasa daw. Natuto siya magbasa. Okay, dati hindi siya marunong. Dulu kau tidak pandai. Tidak. Sekarang pandai sudah. Sekarang pandai sudah. Sekarang pandai sudah. Ayun, marunong na. Very good. Tanong mo, anong gusto nila maging paglaki? Kalaw ka mo ba sa suda? Apa ka mo mau para dyan? O, apa ka mo mau para dyan? Jadi apa? Jadi guru. Ano yun? Teacher. Teacher. Ikaw? Doktor. Doktor! Wow, galing! Haji Min is 12. Twins Muhara and Munira are 9. Annelin is 7. They go to school here at the stairway to home. Tula! An alternative school for children of migrant Filipino families because they're barred from entering Malaysian schools. That's because many, like Nora In's kids, don't even have birth certificates. Nora In has lived in Sabah since 1980, but her roots are in Shokon, Zamboanga del Norte. She looks after her brood in their home in Kampong Kalansanan a water village in Kota Kinabalu, while her husband works as a construction worker. What is this? Ants. How do you spell? Seiway to Hope is less than a year old, first set up in a private home in June last year, catering to 40 pupils. This is their new center. They now have three classrooms inaugurated February 16, amid the standoff then between the Sultanate of Sulu followers and Malaysian authorities. The Alternative Learning Center is indeed a ray of hope in the midst of uncertainty. Its project manager is Filipina Marilu Salgatar Chin, who now considers herself a Sabahan. Especially the island, the beach, the water the city. Actually, ang linis dito. And uh, across this, uh, this sea is uh, Pulau Gaya, where the Filipinos are staying, you know, the first settlers. Mga taga, mga tausog sila, tsaka mga taga Sulu, kagayan Tawi-Tawi, and also yung nandyan, part, yung mga yeah, oo, yung part ng Basilan. So, ang ginagawa nila every day, they come to and fro to the city, just, uh, to do their business. Kasi karamihan sa kanila, mga fishmongers sila, no? Pinagbibili nila yung mga fish na nakatch nila. So, they come. It's so convenient. So, if you were to compare Saba and Southern Philippines? Saba is a very peaceful place. 
I had been here for 32 years and I have not seen much of uh, the southern Philippines. Look at this Tanjung Lipat. It is so peaceful. Ganda ng tubig, ganda ng scenery. And somehow, if you are going to bring up your children, I believe that this is a beautiful place to bring them up. No wonder maraming mga kababayan natin ang gustong tumira dito kasi hindi naman ito malaking lugar. Ano. And uh, for me, this is the, the nearest place to the Philippines. I can always go back to my hometown. And how did your involvement in setting up Stairway to Hope begin? How did you come up with the idea? It came up a few years ago when um, I saw a lot of Filipinos, especially children, roaming the street. They don't go to school. And besides, you know, having a business like this, I do student visas for Filipinos and for other nationalities. And uh, for Filipinos, it's very difficult. If the parents don't have the valid documents and the children don't have the valid documents, they could not obtain a student visa. Or they couldn't even go to public school. So these children are very difficult. They don't study. So they grow up without knowing how to read, how to write the basics. I still remember somewhere in uh, 2008, OK? I was driving and I saw one boy, a seven years old boy, carrying something like yung sako ba, you know, ganis sak, and it seems so heavy. I pull over and I come down and ask him, okay boy, what is this? What are you carrying? And he say he is he's carrying those scrap scrap irons and some bakal, you know, some steel. And I say, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to sell it so that I can help my mother and father buy some food. And instantly I feel such a pity because over and over again you see children like this. And I told myself, my, this boy is a Filipino because it has a characteristic of helping the family, you know. I knew right away because of the hardship. I saw a lot of hardship and I, I told myself, my, this boy, how will he be able to grow up until the age of 21 if he's seven years old and he's carrying such a heavy load already? But anyway, I said, where is your house? And um, he said, it's just over there. And I said, okay, hop in, and I will send you there, you know. <laughs> I'll send you there to, the, to your place. And the boy hop in and put his, his barang barang, you call it barang barang, his, good, his goods in my car. And... Uh, the moment I approach the place, I can see a lot of houses, you know. And once I, this, this boy disembarked, oh my God, there's so many children, so many children running after us. And then uh, they were seeing the boy and seeing me and uh, as if I was a movie star, you know, who appeared to that sagingan, you know, there are plenty of uh, bananas on that place. And I said, oh. Do you have so many children? Yes. And I said, do you go to school? No. What do you do all day? We just play. And I told myself at the back of my mind, what will happen in the next 15 years on these children? They will perish because they don't have any education. So in my heart, it builds up, you know. That you needed children, to do something. I needed to do something. Love is something that you give it away. Next on People. Age is not important, so... Uh, for me, it's, I will learn, I will try my best, I will make my parents proud. It was 45 years ago when the military killed young Muslims they had trained to invade Sabah when then-President Marcos wanted to reclaim the territory. But the recruits rebelled when they were not paid. It became known as a Jabida massacre. For the commando unit, the recruits trained under. The incident sparked the Muslim rebellion. In retaliation, Malaysia armed the MNLF, 
and provided sanctuary to the Filipino Muslim separatist rebels. Malaysia poured funds into the development of Sabah. The Philippine territorial claim on Sabah is traced to an agreement signed in 1878 between the Sultan of Sulu and the North Borneo Chartered Company. The Philippines contends its sovereignty over Sabah continues because the agreement only covered a lease of the territory. Malaysia says the Sultanate of Sulu ceded the territory in 1878. Sabahans also voted to join the Malaysian Federation in a plebiscite in 1963. It was in 1981 when Marilu Salgatar Chin established life in Sabah. What prompted you to establish residency there? It's because of uh, my marriage to a Malaysian Sabahan. Were you apprehensive? What were your feelings about, you know, having to establish a home away from your birthplace? My husband said we are going to continue working in Singapore and uh, we will be residing there. And I said, okay, then let's go, but we have to stay first with uh, the parents in Sabah, Malaysia. So I said, okay, let's go and try Sabah. <laughs> and that's the beginning of a Sabah life, yeah. Would you consider yourself Sabahan? Yes, yes I'm a Sabahan. How do you feel about, you know, what's been going on in the past month between the Philippines and Malaysia? We are living in a multiracial community where we see a lot of Filipinos, Malaysians such as, uh, you know, uh, Malaysians and Indonesians, and as well as races like um, Indians, Chinese, and the Malays, and also some natives in Sabah. So everything is so great. But uh, after this incident in the Hadatu, we feel a little bit alarmed in the beginning, but it did not upset us very much because it didn't even affect Kota Kinabalu City. But then again, we worry for people in Lahadatu, Sabah. Marilu concentrated on raising her brood of three with husband Edward Shin. But in 1997, she began an enterprise after helping Filipinos legalize their stay in Sabah. It involves a lot of documentation of Filipinos, actually. Those were the time when Filipinos are not documented. They didn't have passport, they did not have uh, documents to prove their stay in Sabah. So then, as a Filipino leader, I uh, start moving on to helping people because we are interconnected with the Philippine Embassy. But then again, it becomes too many that uh, we need to do something to earn a living. So I decided to form a company and uh, charge a, a small amount of service fees to the Filipinos so that I myself will be able to earn as much as helping people. That's yeah. the beginning of it. So in the beginning, it was just to help? Yes. Since this involves a lot of undocumented people, we started assisting them in the area of uh, application of the passports, application in uh, the labor departments for the work permits, and the immigration department in uh, Kota Kinabalu, basically, because I stay there. So this is it, in the migration fund board also, and liaising with uh, churches in order to make sure that these people we, uh, Filipino people will avail this documentation program in Sabah, Malaysia. The Filipinos didn't know how to go about it. They didn't know. They, it's very new to them, you know. Unlike Filipinos going to another country, they will go there as OFW, they have their own passports and documents. Here they just cross the The sea. borders, the yeah. sea. They ha have basically nothing. And most most of them came from Mindanao region and the Visayan region. So uh, this started the, how would you call it, man recruitment? Well, how would you call it's it? Placement. It's a legalization. A legalization. Legalization of those uh, foreigners such as Filipinos and Indonesians. Mm. So you became an expert at this? I think so <laughs> now, yes. So this business continues up to the present? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, 
in order to do that we have to obtain a certain uh, license you know licensing from the Malaysian uh, uh, government mm -hmm. so I have both of those from the labor department and the immigration department so uh, we are legally li a legal company private company to do and handle all these work permits if not for your help or this professional service that you provide what would be the situation of these Filipinos? Well, they would I, be, they could be caught anytime and deported. Definitely, definitely, because the Malaysian Enforcement Unit in the Immigration and the Police Department were always all out there to to check on uh, the documents of the foreign nationals like the Filipinos and Indonesians. So if they have proven to to have the valid documents to stay in Sabah, they will not uh, uh, caught them, they will not catch them. Rather, we must have a proper work permit to stay there or a proper visa, like that of any other country. There are, there are many, many times that uh, if uh, you are a Filipino, example, you are a Filipino uh, tourist and you went to Malaysia or Sabah using uh, uh, airplane or using ferry from Sambuanga, many of them overstayed <laughs> and that becomes the problem again over and over again. They come and go and they stay there and become overstaying. So our duty, especially for me, you know, because I'm, I'm still a Filipino, I always advise them to have a valid visa in order to stay in the country. Next on People. Well, it is our responsibility as uh, not only as Pinos but as uh, human beings to, to give help you know, wherever it is uh, needed. Time was when the Sultanate of Sulu reigned all the way to North Borneo the most powerful kingdom in the 17th and 18th century in that part of the world. And even with the borders formed between the Philippines and Malaysia, Sabah has been home to many Filipinos. Everywhere you go, there are Suluks, as they call themselves. From the markets to the stores in Kunak and Semporna, to the construction sites in Kota Kinabalu. There are no exact figures as to the number of Filipinos in Sabah. Estimates range from 800,000 to a million. With about 65,000 political refugees now carrying the coveted IC or identity card, having been bestowed Malaysian citizenship. But majority are undocumented, raising a new generation of stateless children. Without any citizenship, they can't enroll in Malaysian public schools. They're only talking about maybe the old people. What about the young people? You know, they produce, they, they reproduce so fast that uh, you won't know. One family have four, five, six to eight children. There are now 120 children being educated at the stairway to home from the age of seven to 22. Mary Jane Bua is among the eldest of the batch. She was born in Malaysia, but never managed to complete her studies. Mary Jane, what's your ambition? What do you want to be? Um, I'm planning to become a teacher, for sure, but I changed that. I want to become a tourist guy. you consider yourself now Malaysian or Filipino? Um, of course, I'm a Filipino. Always be a Filipino. Um, I, I only live here, but I am Filipino. How does it feel, you know, um, that, you know, your schooling was stopped? Do you feel a little shy? I'm not shy, actually. For me, it's, age doesn't have a problem to learn. Um, age is not important, so uh, for me, it's, I will learn, I will try my best, I will make my parents proud, so I'm not shy. Uh, you're being not embarrassed? A, I'm not embarrassed in being in the class. So, um, even older than me is being um, still school and everything, so I'm not embarrassed. I just want to make my parents proud. Kate Magallanes is one of the Filipino community leaders in Sabah. 
So I give foods, uh, toys, and educational toys, and then uh, biscuits, everything. Pag, uh, feed them. Well, I celebrated my son's birthday. Yes, as a donation. It's my advocacy in life to share the blessings. How do you feel seeing these kids? Na you know they're they're learning the basics at such an um, old age. Na sad, really sad, devastated. Because you know they come here to find a better life, but unfortunately the government is not looking. You know, even though they contributed, it's they try to escape from the poverty in our country, but you know, sad that they cannot go to school because they don't have proper documentation. People witnessed their way to Hope's first parent-teachers association meeting. Hope was in the air as parents met the teachers who are purely volunteers. And mind you, the children were so happy, the parents were so happy, the teachers uh, were so inspired. So um, I told them, let us just keep it burning and we want to to have a better place for them to study. And uh, last Friday, as I went there, I saw the teacher teaching in Letrang Kapit Kabit, ano? 60 billion, <laughs> you know, 600 billion. And I told the teacher, why are you teaching billions now? <laughs> you should be teaching 60, <laughs> up to 100. Man, they learn very fast. These children are really hunger for education. The Alternative Learning Center is also supported by donations from the Philippines, like the Rotary Club of Quezon City. An almost instant uh, uh, impulse on my part to say that uh, this is something that Rotary can do for uh, our, our children, especially Filipino children in Malaysia. So it struck me that our children in Malaysia are deprived of uh, basic education. And so we said that uh, Rotary can help here, even in a very small way. In a recent visit home, Marilu Chin met with Rotary officials to arrange possible training of their teachers and their accreditation by the Department of Education. <laughs> it was also an opportunity to reunite with her family. Very proud kami. Dahil makatutulong siya sa mahirap, doon sa mga batang hindi nakakapag-aral. Noong pa, naandoon ako, tuwan-tuwa ako, siya, sinasama niya ako doon sa, sa lugar ng gagawa ng, ng school. Tuwan-tuwa ako doon. Tuwan-tuwa at mm, kilalang kilala sa, sa Saba, Malaysia. Sa pagtulong sa mga mahirap na tao, mga hindi nag-aaral. Maganda kanyang layo niya. And you said that your dream is to be able to eventually put up a real school, a, a big school. Stairway Our mission to well, is to establish a Stairway to Hope Learning Center in the major towns of Saba. And uh, by doing this, I hope that our Philippine government will see the needs of the education of the Philippine children in Saba. I am very confident that uh, with this effort, our Philippine government will see through. And if they establish a Philippine school in Saba that is uh, actually uh, under the accreditation, accreditation of our Department of Education, these children have more chance to go into the higher level of education. Remember, our school is an alternative learning center where they can learn how to read, write, and the count. So this um, uh, act of uh, putting Stairway to Hope is helping children, but in a way, it's also um, kind of rewarding no? for, for you. It, how, has, how has it been rewarding for the Filipino community to help? Anong fulfillment ang nakukuha niyo? Ito yung na patunayan ko na ang mga Pilipino handang tumulong. Bigyan mo lang sila ng avenue ng pagtulong. Sabihin mo lang sa kanila, kailangan natin itong gawin for the benefit of our people and for the benefit of yourself. You have to do it willingly according to your heart content. 
we can achieve far greater things rather than si shopping ka na lang o yichikitsika with your friends o mag-alaga ng mga anak mo o kayo na mga lalaki pagkatapos ng trabaho nyo marami pa kayong pwedeng gawin I said let's do something for other people let's do something for ourselves na we can give something to the society the occupation of Lahad Datu by the followers of the Sultanate of Sulu has shed light on the dire situation faced by a generation of Filipino children. The stairway to hope is going to be a long and difficult climb. It seeks to repair broken dreams and fulfill unrequited hopes that have brought Filipinos to the shores of Sabah. I'm Cesc Orenia Drilon and this is People on ANC.